Hello, I'm hematologist oncologist Dr. Tony Talibi. Now we're going to discuss the management of extensive stage small cell lung cancer. We're back with Dr. Jorge Gomez, assistant professor of medicine at the University of Miami and co-leader of thoracic oncology. Okay, let's say a patient has had a biopsy of a lung mass and it shows that it's small cell lung cancer. You've done a PET scan and it shows other areas in the body that are lighting up. What happens next for that patient? When patients have disease outside of the chest when they have small cell lung cancer, that disease is then considered, unfortunately, incurable. Mm -hmm. um, we can't cure patients who have disease that cannot be radiated. Chemotherapy can never get rid of all of that disease. It may be able to shrink the disease as much as possible. We may not be able to see anything after chemotherapy, but that disease will grow back. And so we have to plan a course of systemic chemotherapy for those patients. Uh, and if they have a very good response, do radiation to the brain to prevent the disease from growing in the brain. Mm -hmm. How does a patient's overall well-being and performance status change your decision-making tree? In small cell lung cancer, that has a little bit less of an impact than a lot of other cancers. Um, we sometimes treat patients who are very weak and have a poor performance status because of the cancer mm -hmm. aggressively, and usually we will have a very good outcome because if the tumor is causing a lot of symptoms and we can shrink the tumor very quickly, then patients will improve. And, okay. and fortunately, small cell lung cancer is a tumor that's very responsive to chemotherapy. Very nice. How do you address areas of pain with cancer? Well, in small cell lung cancer, again, since chemotherapy works so well, it's very common for us to give a first cycle of chemotherapy and a couple of weeks later have a patient come back and say, my pain is gone. Mm -hmm. When there has been a lot of damage to tissue or when chemotherapy cannot address it, uh, we will often do radiation therapy. And radiation is usually a very fec effective way of, of addressing pain uh, in bone or, or soft tissue lesions from cancer. <clears throat> what uh, usual pain medicines do you utilize? We use every pain medicine available. We use morphine, uh, oxycodone, we use fentanyl patches, uh, we use fentanyl lollipops, so we use a lot of different things depending on, on patients. If patients can't swallow, we try to go with a patch or go with a lollipop. Um, if patients are able to do anything, we usually will use long-acting narcotics mm -hmm. with, in, in addition to short-acting narcotics. So there are a lot of pain medicines that we can use, and we have a lot of procedures that we can do to address pain. I see. Oh. Oftentimes, many of our patients <coughs> take herbal or alternative medicines. What do, you, what do you think about that? What I tell my patients is that I would like for them to show me whatever they're taking before they take it. Uh, there are a lot of herbal medicines or natural medicines that are harmless and that don't interfere with chemotherapy. And there are some natural medicines that are extremely harmful. Uh, there are poisonous plants in a lot of areas in the world. Um, I have seen patients die from massive liver failure from taking certain medicines mm -hmm. or not quote unquote medicines that are actually clearly natural products. So it's very important to talk to your doctor, show them what you're doing, um, and then get there okay before using other things in addition to chemotherapy. I see. <clears throat> now if you were to recommend chemotherapy, which chemotherapy would you recommend for small cell exten extensive stage? Well. The truth is that there is really one standard regimen in the United States for uh, limited, uh, ex excuse me, extensive small cell lung cancer, and that is a combination of platinum, mm -hmm. either a carboplatin or a cisplatin regimen with another drug called etoposide. There are regimens that are used in other areas of the world, for example in Japan, uh, the regimen of irinotecan plus mm -hmm. platinum is also very common. Uh, we also use irinotecan here. Some people actually like to use it. But the etoposide and platinum regimen is a fairly simple regimen without a lot of toxicities. Uh, and so we usually have that as a standard. How is that regimen administered? These drugs are given all intravenously. The treatment lasts for three days, and we call that three-day treatment one cycle. And those cycles are repeated every three weeks. Mm -hmm. And so you get three days of chemotherapy, three weeks later again, and we usually will do between four and six of those cycles, uh, depending on how well it's tolerated by the patient. Mm -hmm. Does the patient need to be admitted to the hospital, or is this an outpatient regimen? 
Fortunately, these are all outpatient regimens that don't require hospitalization. And what side effects can the patient experience? People can have the same side effects as with most other chemotherapies. The minor side effects like nausea, vomiting, fatigue are fairly common, but usually not very severe unless we use the cisplatin, which actually tends to produce a lot of nausea. Um, hair loss happens with almost every regimen. Uh, the major side effects and, and the ones we really worry about are the possibility of infections because of low white blood cells uh, and kidney toxicities from these chemotherapies. <clears throat> How do you address the nausea and vomiting for patients with stage 4? What do you send them home with? We, uh, we are very aggressive in treating nausea and vomiting in, in lung cancer. Uh, we give several medicines before and with the chemotherapy to try to prevent nausea and vomiting. Mm -hmm. And we always send patients home with regimens to try to control nausea and vomiting if they happen. And so we usually will give patients drugs like Compazine, uh, Zofran, and Decadron, or Ativan. Mm -hmm. uh, we sometimes, depending on the regimen, we will give patients two drugs. Uh, for regimens that cause a lot of nausea and vomiting, we often will give them four drugs to take home with a little calendar explaining how to take those drugs. I see. <clears throat> what about loss of appetite in cancer? How do you address that? Loss of appetite is unfortunately a very common scenario in lung cancer. Uh, there are several medicines that you can use. Uh, the simplest ones are a steroid called Megase, mm -hmm. which is a white liquid. Um, that's usually the one we start to use first. Uh, there are other drugs. Um, there are other anabolic steroids that we can use that are injectable, uh, and there are derivatives of marijuana that we can use. Uh, they're very common and legal prescription uh, medicines uh, that we can use. How do you deal with difficulty sleeping in your cancer patients? Cancer patients will often have difficulty sleeping. Um, quality of life is extremely important for patients with lung cancer, and so we do everything we can to try to improve quality of life. We give them simple tools like drinking warm beverages and trying not to sleep throughout the day. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also use prescription medications in many, many patients when, mm -hmm. when those simple things don't work. So basically, if they're having difficulty sleeping, that's something they should address? Oh, you physician. should always... Anything that happens to you while you're receiving <coughs> chemotherapy, you should always discuss with your oncologist. Uh, because oncologists will usually have either a solution or will know where to go to get a solution. I see. What about dealing with depression in a potentially in an incurable situation? How do you address that situation? Depression is a very common problem in patients with incurable lung cancer. And we are usually very quick to start antidepressants. Um, I think that patients are slightly more reluctant to actually start them than we are. Uh, we're very easy to do that because, again, quality of life is extremely important. We want to do everything to improve a patient's quality of life. And, and treating depression is one of the big things that we do. Uh, we also are very quick to send patients to one of our counseling centers, to either psychiatrists or psychologists, because they can often help patients feel significantly better. <clears throat> How do you know whether the cancer is re responding to your treatment? We follow cancers usually with CAT scans. Uh, lung cancer, unfortunately, does not have a reliable blood marker that one can follow, and so we can only follow the disease if we can either see it, for example, uh, metastases under the skin or lymph nodes in the neck that we can measure, or do CAT scans uh, to actually measure lesions. <clears throat> what about the situation where the family does not wish for you to discuss the actual diagnosis or prognosis with the patient? How do you address that situation? Every patient has the right to know exactly what's happening to them and what will happen to them. They have a right to know what they want to know. And very often, many patients won't want to know. Mm -hmm. And patients will allow us to speak to their families in a separate setting and tell the family everything that may or may not happen while they prefer to remain a little bit on the sideline. Uh, if a patient wants to know, they need to know. If a patient doesn't want to know, I'm always happy to speak just to the family. So that's something that should be made very clear in the initial visit, yes? Correct. Okay. If, if you are a patient and you do not wish to have every little detail of information, you should make that known uh, so that physicians understand that, that you may not want to know certain things. I see. Sometimes, even when the cancer has spread to other parts, patients ask us whether we can surgically remove every single piece of the cancer. What is your answer to that? 
With small cell lung cancer, surgery really has a very limited role, and that role is in very small lesions in the lung uh, with no other areas of disease. Mm -hmm. And so for, for this type of disease, <coughs> surgery is really almost never discussed. I see. <clears throat> uh, let's, let's say, let's assume that the patient does not have any cancer that is spread to the brain. Would you ever consider prophylactic radiation to the brain even though they don't have any cancer in the brain yet? We always consider prophylactic cranial irradiation after chemotherapy if patients have had a good response to chemotherapy. There are now uh, clinical trials that have shown that giving patients radiation therapy to the brain after all of the disease in the chest has, or the rest of the body has come down, uh, helps. It definitely cuts the likelihood of the disease coming back in the brain, and it can improve patient survival. But is there any downside to that in terms of cognition? There is a downside. There are uh, definite side effects that can happen from radiation therapy to the brain. Uh, there are some cognitive defects. In general, those cognitive defects are not severe. Um, and when this tumor does come back in the brain, it can often be a very tragic thing. It is an aggressive tumor. It can grow very quickly, and it can cause irreparable harm when it mm -hmm. comes back in the brain. I see. <clears throat> would you please explain what a clinical trial is and whether you would recommend it or not? Clinical trials are basically studies of either new procedures or new drugs, and in our field, really, uh, studies of new drugs or new ways of giving old drugs that look for a better treatment. And so usually what we're looking for in clinical trials is finding a better way to treat patients or a way that will give them a better outcome. Participating in clinical trials is always appropriate as long as the clinical trial is appropriate for the patient. Mm -hmm. uh, there are clinical trials that are specifically for a first treatment. There are clinical trials that are for a second or a third treatment after a first or second treatment has failed. So they're always very appropriate. <coughs> Would you please explain what the code status is in healthcare proxy and when do you actually discuss that with your patients? In patients who have an incurable cancer, it's very important to decide up front what kind of life prolonging measures they might want to have at the end of life. Discussing end of life issues is, is very, very important because we often do many things at the end of life that don't help patients. And, and the reason is usually that we haven't discussed those issues up front. And so talking about end of life issues should happen before it is completely necessary. Mm -hmm. It should happen at the beginning of treatment. Mm -hmm. um, although it's often difficult to talk about those things at the moment of the diagnosis of cancer, uh, it's usually the best time to do so. Because very often at the end, it's too late to really talk about them. We often have to start life prolonging measures that will not prolong life because we really hadn't invested the time in discussing these issues up front. I see. <clears throat> when do you think it's appropriate for a patient to enroll either in a palliative care setting or hospice with extensive stage small cell? There comes a moment when treating the cancer may actually cause more harm than good. Mm -hmm. uh, there are definite scenarios where giving more chemotherapy will make things worse in terms of quality of life. Mm -hmm. And at that time, chemotherapy probably should be done even if the patient really wants it. Physicians are usually very good at knowing when their chemotherapy is probably not going to work. And, and that's a moment when choosing not to be treated is probably the best decision. Um, palliative care measures should be started from the beginning because palliative care measures really just uh, are trying to improve quality of life. And mm -hmm. we should always improve quality of life no matter when we started. Um, but life prolonging measures are a very different thing. I so see. so it's important when the physician tells you that a treatment is not going to work, it's probably better not to do it and to, and to really seek comfort measures. I see. <clears throat> How do you give your patients hope with extensive stage but at the same time remain realistic? I think hope is something that's very specific to every patient. Mm -hmm. What we can offer in patients with small cell lung cancer with chemotherapy is to prolong life 
and to improve quality of life. And it's important that those expectations be clear mm -hmm. and that patients not have expectations that are unrealistic. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to give hope, but it's important not to give unrealistic hope. And so giving the expect expectation up front will allow the patient to make decisions about what they do with their remaining time. Mm -hmm. It helps them really focus on things that fulfill them, that, that improve their quality of life, that give them pleasure, that help them be with family members rather mm -hmm. than spending all of that time pursuing treatments that may or may not help. I see. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. thank, you. thank you for watching. We hope this has been educational for you.